So good afternoon. I welcome you to this Deep Cuts Commission briefing, Rethinking Nuclear Arms Control. My name is Oliver Meyer. I'm senior researcher at the Berlin office of the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. And uh, my institute, IFSH, together with the Arms Control Association in Washington and IMEMO in Moscow coordinates the Deep Cuts Commission, which is a trilateral group of experts from the United States, from Russia, and from Germany. As a group, we actively participate in and try to contribute to the wider debate on arms control. We are publishing issue briefs and working papers, which you can find on our um, web page. But like many others these days, um, we also use these virtual briefings to inform decision makers and the broader public on relevant developments in the world of arms control. One day after the election, this uh, is an obviously good um, opportunity to discuss the way forward with arms control. But I have to say we were hoping for some more clarity on the context um, forward um, and the way forward on arms control. Um, but here we are um, in a situation where we all are also watching the news with one eye. Uh, but we are very happy and grateful that we have uh, Rose Gottemeller with us, joining us from California, where it's still very early uh, in the morning. She just told me she did get some sleep um, um, over this uh, night, um, um, which has been very exciting and Rose obviously is one of the few people who has so much experience in this field that she can look beyond such details as the results of US presidential elections. Before I give the floor uh, to Rose uh, and before we hear brief comments from two members of the Deep Cuts Commission, Andrei Zagorski and Götz Neuneck, a few remarks on the ground rules for this meeting. Um, we are recording this briefing and we will post it afterwards on the Deep Cuts Commission website. That's one reason to go to the website. You can also find our publications there, including three very new papers uh, that we published um, just over the last week on missile defense, strategic stability talks and new start extensions. So many reasons to look up our websites um, for this meeting. We have had more than 100 registrations, so quite a big group following this. And we will therefore take your questions only via the questions and answer functions, which you can see um, at the bottom of your screen. And my colleague, Lena Hilgert, who is working with me on the Deep Cuts Commission, uh, screening questions in the background, and I will then put them to the speakers. Um, apologies in advance if we don't get to your questions. Obviously, we cannot answer all the questions over the next hour um, that we have. The Deep Cuts Commission started seven years ago already in 2013, um, time that looks like an entirely different era uh, now. Um, and throughout the years, the project has been supported by the Federal Foreign Office. Um, we are very, very grateful for that continuous support, which is a rare thing these days that um, such projects can be uh, receive support over such a long uh, time. Um, and that's even more important these days in these troubling times for, for arms control. We are very happy um, that Susanne Baumann, the federal government's commissioner for disarmament and arms control is joining us today. She will kick us off, briefly introduce Rose um, and maybe the topic. And um, then we are look forward to the discussion with Rose and um, our two commentators. But first, the floor over to you for a moment. Thank you very much, Oliver Meyer, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the Deep Cuts Commission organizing uh, today's briefing, Rethinking Nuclear Arms Control. Um, not only you are grateful for the support of the German Foreign Office, we are also very grateful for the work of the Deep Cuts Commission over the last couple of years. And I think that's quite a unique forum bringing together uh, scientists uh, from the US, from Russia and uh, from Europe. I think a format we uh, intend to support also in the future because we got a lot of uh, very good impetus by your work uh, for our work as, as government. So uh, this uh, briefing could be not more timely as you have mentioned one day after the US election. 
and without wanting to compare, com uh, compare the two events one day before the kickoff of uh, the capturing technology rethinking arms control conference in the German foreign ministry. Um, I think uh, time is overdue to stop the erosion of uh, arms control and it's important to provide a new impetus and momentum to arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. Uh, this for me includes very clearly uh, preserving treaties that provide security, new start, uh, just to mention one, but also um, rethinking arms control in the light of the various challenges that new players, new technologies and new domains oppose to the arms control architecture. Rose, I could not think of a better and more experienced expert to discuss these matters than with you. I always appreciated your realistic approach to arms control, stressing that arms control is not an end in itself, but a contribution to our security. And at the same time, you never lost vision of what can and should be achieved in the near or distant future. Your recent article and today's briefing on the topic will be uh, the best proof of it. Dear audience, allow me to uh, very briefly introduce Rose Gottemüller, whom I know and uh, from whom I learned a lot over the last couple of years. Before becoming a Frank E. and Arthur W. Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute and a non-resident senior fellow in Carnegie's Nuclear Policy Program, Rose Gottemüller served as a Deputy Secretary General of NATO the highest position ever held by a woman at NATO. Until 2016, in her position at the Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security, she advised the US Secretary of State on non-proliferation, arms control and uh, political military affairs, the INF Treaty being one of them. As the chief U.S. negotiator of the New Star Treaty with Russia, she knows the treaty, its genesis and negotiation history better than any one of us. In previous position, for instance, as director of the Carnegie Moscow Center at the U.S. Department of Energy or the National Security Council in the White House, she was responsible for non-proliferation cooperation with Russia and the newly independent states and the denuclearization in Euro Ukraine, Kazakhstan and Belarus. Rose, thank you very much for sharing your views with us today. I'm looking very much forward to this and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. It's a great honor to have you here with us today. And thank you uh, also to Olivier Meyer for organizing this with his colleagues and to Götz Mönnick and to Andrei Zagorski for, uh, for being here from the Deep Cuts Commission. It's uh, really fantastic. And to all those who are listening, a good evening in Moscow, a good uh, uh, afternoon in Europe, and it's morning for us here in America. We will see what kind of morning it ends up uh, being, but uh, I for one predicted when uh, Oliver was organizing this that we would not have the results of the election on the morning of November 4th. So I was quite serene that we would be talking uh, this morning with the possibility that there could be two very different presidents in the White House uh, come the end of January. And in fact, the article that I wrote uh, for the Washington Quarterly was written with exactly that in mind that either President Trump would continue with a second term in office or that a new President Biden would be taking over. So I do think that the proposals in the Washington Quarterly article are, uh, are quite relevant in either case. I'll summarize very briefly, I think the, the main agenda items, and I urge you if you haven't had a chance to read the entire article, but I put three phases uh, out. 
first phase, I say necessary to extend the New START Treaty, I argue for five years as is permitted by the treaty in order to ensure that we have enough time to tackle the second phase, which is more difficult, more ambitious, but very, very necessary. Along with the extension of New START, I argue for an additional reduction in, uh, in uh, operationally deployed uh, nuclear warheads, which as I say, could ride on the back of the New START Treaty, the way that the 2002 Moscow Treaty rode on the back of the START Treaty, the two things would fit together. And I believe both of those could be accomplished quickly. In the second phase, however, we do and we should take on more uh, ambitious tasks, including limiting and constraining uh, warheads. And I know there have been some discussions of that already between Moscow and Washington. I'll come back to that in a moment. But also I believe it's high time that we begin to talk to China and I do support the efforts of the Trump administration to bring China to the table, not to bring it to a strategic arms reduction negotiation because China's arsenal is so much smaller than that of the United States and that of Russia, but to begin to talk about systems where they have greater equality of numbers and particularly intermediate range missiles uh, ground launched in nature that are deployed in Eurasia. So I do think that that also will be a very long and difficult negotiation, a very difficult discussion to begin with, even to urge China to come to the table. But nevertheless, I think that is a worthy goal for the second phase that I am talking about. The third phase I want to uh, emphasize because I do think it's important we all start thinking about the future of uh, where we go with arms control, nuclear arms control. And so I very much wanted to endorse the conference that Suzanne Bauman and the Foreign Office are, uh, are sponsoring tomorrow. And I very much look forward to seeing the out, uh, outcome of that uh, conference. But I'll just note that I really think it's important to pay attention to the advent of some new technologies that give us wider verification and monitoring perspectives than we have had in the past. And I particularly think that with the large constellations of commercial satellites that are able to image the surface of the earth repeatedly throughout the day, and there are more and more of them available, we need to think about refurbishing the notion of national technical means and what exactly is meant uh, by national technical means. As you know, these in the past have been large satellites owned by states. They have been uh, Sat, uh, uh, sorry, radars flown on, on aircraft. They have been over the horizon radars. Now I think we can consider what it would be like to bring some commercial assets to bear. And I think there's an important reason that this may be attractive, not only to Russia, but to China and to other possible participants in arms control negotiations. And that is because the better your NTM are, the bad, better your national technical means are, the less you have to rely on on-site inspection, on inspectors on the ground. And so I think it's a, a way that we can all develop a mutual interest in developing uh, better national technical means. And then of course, underscoring the principle that's ensconced in New START as it was in all the treaties before it. And that is there should be non-interference with national technical means. Now, let me end my re remarks by saying, I think there are two very interesting ideas on the table already. And I think they deserve to be uh, pursued no matter who again arrives in the White House on the 20th of January. The first is the uh, exchange, the negotiation that's been going on between Moscow and Washington, wherein the Trump administration has proposed a, a freeze uh, on all warheads uh, that would uh, develop some verification measures to go along with it, as well as an extension of New START. I do understand that uh, a one-year extension is on the table and the, the Kremlin has accepted that. Uh, I continue to argue for five years, but nevertheless, I do think it is, uh, it is an offer that deserves further work and we should be considering how to carry it forward because establishing the principle that we are going to work next on limiting and controlling warheads, including their monitoring and verification, is a very important principle to establish. So uh, I wish the negotiators well as they continue their work and I uh, would welcome comments from the audience about that idea today. But the other interesting idea that is on the table is uh, the idea for uh, improving the moratorium offer that came from uh, the Russian Federation a year ago, moratorium on deployment of intermediate range ground launch systems uh, in Europe. The reason it's an improvement is that the Russian Federation has finally put the 9M729 missile on the table. 
uh, always, uh, well, in my time trying to negotiate about this matter, the, the Russian Federation was denying the existence of the missile. Now, at least uh, they are acknowledging that the missile exists and now it has been put on the table. Of course, I find the offer made so far inadequate. It would only focus verification and monitoring on the Kaliningrad region, as I understand it. But it is an offer to look at and to think about ways to improve, to develop at the negotiating table. So I think uh, we have two very different but very interesting proposals coming from opposite capitals, from uh, one from Washington, the other from Moscow, and they do deserve further consideration. So with that, uh, Oliver, I'll turn it back over to you and I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, summarizing your article, um, but also linking it to the current discussion we are having in the political sphere on how to move um, forward. Thank you also for mentioning verification, which is the key topic which uh, IFSH is contributing to the Rethinking Arms Control Conference uh, at the Foreign Office. So this sits well between um, your great article and, and the meeting um, that, that is going to take place um, at the Foreign Office, or virtually, I should say, but organized by the Foreign Office over the next two days. Um, one of the trademarks of the DPATS Commission is that it's a trilateral um, group. So we uh, have invited uh, two commission members from uh, Moscow and from Wuppertal in Germany to comment um, on your input. Um, first up is uh, Andrei Zagorski, who is the head of the Department of Disarmament and Conflict Resolution at IMIMO, our Russian partner in this project. Andrei, if you briefly want to uh, pick up some of the ideas that um, Rose has spoken on, over to you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, let me raise three points uh, for the sake of the time and we can come back to other issues uh, in the debate to which I'm looking forward. Well, first of all, Rose has mentioned uh, the US proposal for uh, sketching out the treaty and uh, uh, extending the new start for one year. In fact, I believe we are at the very beginning of, of real bargaining uh, on, on what happens to the new start and uh, where we go next. Uh, the US proposal was linking uh, extension for one year to Russian agreement on the parameters of a new treaty, which would include also different types, new types of verification, etc. Russia has responded to this, saying, let us extend it to one year for one year uh, and then discuss the parameters of a new treaty later on, uh, having, having won the time for doing so. Uh, so the, the actual bargaining would be uh, forthcoming. I would not expect Moscow to uh, be more specific before the US election, not least because the Biden campaign would promise to extend uh, the new start uh, without preconditions. Uh, and uh, why would Moscow agree to the US proposal uh, if it could have a chance of, of extending new start for free? Uh, but the issue of the, of the parameters of a new agreement uh, is, is there. My second point will be uh, even if we suggest that Biden wins and we have a new start uh, extended for five years, uh, the, any, reaching any agreement on the substance of a new treaty would be very difficult. So this, the problem would not go away, in particular because uh, uh, the, the Trump administration has suggested to cover all nuclear weapons and warheads by the new treaty. The idea is not entirely new, but we never came close to such an agreement. We, uh, looked forward to this in 1997 while, while agreeing on the parameters for the START III. Uh, verification was a big issue at this time. So, uh, of course, including all types of, of nuclear weapons would be uh, an issue here. Uh, and uh, this, time, this time it will be also the INF range uh, systems which, uh, which were not discussed within the START III projects. So, this will not go away and discussing, uh, discussing the PATH uh, uh, to a new agreement would be no less difficult, no matter who wins uh, the election. So the hard bargaining time is still there. My third point is uh, on China. I would generally agree with your argument uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, lost case of getting China into the strategic arms, strategic nuclear arms uh, reductions talks. Uh, I see a problem elsewhere because if we look at the possible options, uh, 
what would we do? Would we grant China the same limits on the strategic weapons as the US and Russia enjoy? Uh, I don't think this would be in the, in, in the interest of either the US or of Russia. Uh, the second option would be uh, we would freeze China where it is for the moment. I don't think this is an option for China. Freezing the inequality. China wants equality. And number three would be if the US and Russia continue going down to be more or less equal with China, uh, the chances of, chi of China joining this, uh, this framework could, could grow. Uh, this brings me to two points uh, to finalize my, my uh, introductory remarks. First of all, I believe that uh, next step should be bilateral. And this is what you discuss in the article. And I think you have a great idea that we can go down to 1000 on both sides, even, even without waiting for a new treaty. And verifying this by the extended new start means exactly what we did with the source. So this will be again, another elegant solution for this. Uh, and this will be another, another step forward to going down uh, with, this, with this issue. And then negotiate a more complex, more complicated issue of how we, address uh, address uh, all types of nuclear weapons, which is very difficult, but I would not say impossible. Uh, this would not be entirely possible. However, the second conclusion would be, if we include all types of nuclear weapons uh, uh, into the negotiation and into the new framework, uh, this would skip your idea of not talking to China on strategic arms, but talk to China on nuclear uh, intermediate range uh, weapons. If we would include all the weapons into the framework, this would of course change, uh, change the uh, negotiating landscape uh, for China and this may, may make it more difficult. So we entering a very complex phase uh, and it's going to be an interesting phase uh, and we'll do our best to generate ideas to help. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, the first questions are coming in before I give uh, the floor to Goetz. Um, Send your questions via the Q&A um, function at the bottom. We are collecting these questions and then uh, once uh, Gert says, uh, made his comments, we will uh, start the discussion on these points that you raise in the Q&A. Goetz uh, Neuneck is one of the founding fathers, if I can say so, of the commission, um, has, um, has initiated uh, this project. Um, and I'm very happy that um, he is uh, commenting on this from a German perspective, from Wuppertal, I think. Uh, over to you, Wetz. Thank you, Oliver. I hope you can hear me. Um, I feel honored to take part here in this discussion. Um, I'm, it's good to see you, Rose, and Ambassador Baumann, and all others uh, who are listening. Uh, this is certainly a quite knowledgeable um, audience, and I'm looking forward for the discussions. Um, let, let me first applaud Rose's uh, Washington Quarterly paper and her suggestions about rethinking nuclear arms control. I think it's high time that we regain impetus, as Ambassador Baumann said, to uh, stop the erosion of nuclear arms control and to fill in some uh, ideas to uh, avoid arms, very expensive arms races. Um, the expectations of many countries, governments, and uh, civil society about re-establishing nuclear arms control are quite uh, high for a potential Biden administration, which hopefully gives arms control highest priority. Uh, if uh, Trump wins, it will be decisive that the collapse of the arms control regimes, and there are several, is prevented and new measures for restraint and risk reduction are implemented. Uh, let me uh, make three points. First is, of course, a uh, new start uh, in our Deep Cuts paper, to, Deep Cuts paper together with my co-authors Lynn Rustin from Washington and Anatoly Diakov, we made clear that an extension of new start for five years is essential to preserve its benefits, which are exercising restraint and preserving successful verification measures, which are needed. Um, if that is gone, I think verification in any aspect would be very hard to re-establish. Uh, it is also, uh, from my point of view, key for NATO partners and European countries that uh, new, a new uh, trust and an environment for robust negotiations for a follow-on treaty is created and that uh, in the long term, uh, the uh, 
not only the strategic systems are addressed, but also intermediate and shorter range nuclear capable systems, which are no longer limited by the INF Treaty. Um, nevertheless, verification and monitoring of the limitation and reduction of all nuclear warheads, warheads is a tough challenge. You, uh, several years ago, initiated IPNDV, the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification. Uh, this is, I think, a quite successful project, but this project also shows how complicated it is to, to differentiate between different types of nuclear weapons, tactical, sub-strategic, strategic. I think we need uh, the preservation of a strategic arms control treaty, otherwise it will be very hard to follow future developments in that uh, respect. I think it's also important that nuclear, that on the nuclear arms control agenda uh, is not only focused only on the US and Russia, but the P that the P5 states starting discussing risk reduction measures and in intensify their dialogue and reporting on their bloated stockpiles, doctrines and implementing risk reduction in the context of new technological developments uh, uh, and I may mean here quite concrete developments, not artificial intelligence, which is still far away from implementation, but things like missile defense, cyber threats, hypersonic weapons, offensive conventional strike weapons. Um, from an European point of view, I think the stability of the non proliferation treaty is very important. Uh, and the US and the Russian Federation under Article 6 must show their commitments uh, as a, uh, a responsible nuclear armed state. And this includes, by the way, also some progress in preserving the functioning of JCPOA. Uh, the next uh, point is incentivizing Chinese participation for new arms control regulations in Asia by deploying U US ground basic uh, based ground based missiles in the region as a replacement to the INF treaty this looks from, from at least my point of view, a little bit problematic and can trigger uh, a new regional arms race, uh, either in Euro the European area as well as in, in, in Asia. Uh, both, it's true, both Russia and China are investing more and more in ground launch missiles on, in the Far East, especially, which raises the threat perception in both reason, uh, regions. So it's important to discuss these issues but we have not found any means until today to differentiate different dual use systems, whether it is a carrier system with a nuclear payload or a conventional payload. So this dual use problematic is unsolved and is a growing problem, which is also called nuclear entanglement of conventional forces and creates serious problems for crisis stability. So we should have that in, in mind. So I think, um, Verification is, is important, uh, but uh, it's a paradigm shift to uh, move from verification of carrier systems or the total elimination of them, as done in the INF context, to a regime which includes verification of warheads. Because uh, you made some very good proposals, by the way, on uh, uh, on-site, reentry vehicle on-site inspections, or you mentioned um, commercial uh, satellites and actors in that field. But I think this is still far away and we actually need to stop the dynamic we have in Europe here about the deployment of dual use, conventional or nuclear strike systems. I think that should be on the table and I will not go into any detail about conventional arms control, but I think for the Europeans, conventional uh, arms control is not uh, dead. Uh, our colleagues, uh, Wolfgang Zellner, Steve Pfeiffer, and uh, Ola, Olga Olika made a quite good proposal, a fresh approach to arms control. And I think this forms a good basis for future systematic talks between NATO, Russia, and the US, which needs, by the way, the full awareness of uh, an US government, but also by NATO to, to, to uh, achieve some kind of uh, breakthroughs here. So um, I think my time is over and I'm looking forward for the uh, deb debates, the questions and our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. Um, and thanks to all three uh, speakers for being brief. Also, we have a good half hour now for the
questions which are coming in from you. Um, I would give Rose the opportunity to respond also to some of the points raised by Andre and Götz, but let me maybe also put to you three questions on the US politics um, on arms control, which are, I think, a bit independent of who will eventually win um, the presidential elections. Um, Amy Wolf um, from the Congressional Research Service asks um, Rose directly, first, why do you think a reduction to 1,000 warheads would be quick and easy? Doesn't it require a policy choice to make that reduction and the political support to do so from the legislative branch? And secondly, uh, what form do you think future arms control should take if one assumes that a closely divided Senate is unlikely to consent to the ratification of any treaty presented by a Democratic president? And Greg Thielman, fellow commissioner, um, um, asks from Washington, um, the probable retention of Republican control of the Senate will make ratification of any future strategic nuclear arms control agreement less likely, even with the Biden administration. So a similar a question, how should this affect our thinking about negotiating strategy Rose, If you want to respond to the comments and maybe also comment on how do we move forward, given you know, what we know already about uh, the outcome of the elections, that would be great. Over to you. Yes, well, I am um, rather a proponent of continuing to, uh, frankly, to push the Senate to uh, fulfill their constitutional duty to give advice and consent to treaties when we simply walk away and say we're not going to try anymore. It allows them to duck that responsibility. I've discussed this with Amy and with Greg on several occasions, and I think my, uh, my, uh, how shall I put it, my commitment in this regard is born on the process of ratifying the new START treaty, which wasn't easy. It took an enormous amount of heavy lift lifting, but I do believe that when senators are allowed to engage with the process from beginning to end, uh, and that included visits of the National Security Working Group to, uh, to Geneva during the negotiations and many, many briefings on Capitol Hill, I do believe that uh, they can be brought to uh, to agree to a treaty on the basis of uh, its value to US national security. That said, I do acknowledge and recognize the difficulties uh, and that it takes time uh, and effort. And so I do also endorse uh, the many ideas that are out there about proceeding in different ways. Uh, some talk about executive agreements, some talk about parallel unilateral initiatives uh, that might be taken, wherein we would agree to a reduction, the Russians would agree to a reduction and then we would verify and monitor that process, but they would be essentially unilateral commitments. So there are different ways to go about it. I do not discard any of those kinds of ideas, but I do, uh, I do uh, enjoin us all not to give up on the, on the um, concept of advice and consent by the Senate because it is an important responsibility of theirs. And I continue to believe that we should push in that direction. Uh, for Amy's question about why I think it would be uh, simple, um, of course it requires political commitment. We do know that President Trump for many years has wanted a significant uh, reduction that he could call his own. And uh, as I've understood it, the willingness of the administration to extend New Start was only the prelude to uh, seeking some, uh, some further uh, reductions. Now that's not uh, agreed by all members, of his party, I know there are many experts on the Republican side of the aisle who push back against the notion of any further reductions, but I do believe uh, given his history that the president himself would like to see a further reduction. And it is that high level uh, support and endorsement of course that always drives these, these things forward. I also base my view on the fact that uh, already at Berlin, in 2013, uh, President Obama put on the table the notion that an up to one third further reduction could be possible and that that uh, up to one third uh, further reduction was, was endorsed uh, by the US military. So I think that from the perspective of uh, the analytical work uh, and so forth, uh, we could say that 
that such a, a reduction could already be supported. Again, I recognize there are some uh, experts who say we need more warheads now, and in fact, no more uh, reductions are possible. Uh, that is a topic for debate and discussion, but I think it is uh, something that is, uh, that it is possible to accomplish and uh, to do it rather, rather quickly. Thank you very much. Um, let's maybe have three questions to you, but I think the others may also want to come in on nuclear arms control with regard to non-strategic intermediate range um, weapons. In your, your article, you suggest to put the N back in INF um, to distinguish between nuclear and non-nuclear uh, weapons as a way also to pave the way for China um, to uh, be involved in uh, arms control and nuclear arms control or missile arms control. Um, there are three questions on the three countries that are um, concerned with this question. Um, to Rose, a question from uh, Nobu Akiyama uh, from Japan um, on China. Uh, what in, you know, with regard to uh, arms control negotiations with China, uh, he asked, with what criteria can we distinguish strategic and non-strategic, substrategic uh, weapons, given the United States and China do not share the same geographical and functional concepts of strategic, question that's also of relevance to Europe, actually. Um, and then Steve Pfeiffer, fellow commissioner, asks on uh, the Russian moratorium offer. If the Russians still claim the 9M729 has a range of less than 500 kilometers, it would seem that inspectors that, ins that inspections to prove that would require looking inside the missile. If US inspectors could see the engine, fuel tank, um, etc., um, could they come to a conclusion on the range? And that would be addressed to Andre, I suppose. Is there any chance that Russia would allow, allow such an inspection? And finally, from William Courtney, uh, on the US side of this, the US uh, Army seems interested in non-nuclear INF range missile systems. And in fact, I think three different such systems are under development, could the US allow them to be accountable in a nuclear agreement? So different perspectives on the same problem of involving and separating and differentiating intermediate range, non-strategic um, weapons, missiles in a future agreement. If you want to go first again, Rose, then maybe Götz and Andre could come in on the verification and the Russian side as well. Right, thank you. Excellent questions. I did have a chance to, uh, to go through the Q&A quickly, uh, and I think all of the questions are very, very good. So thank you to uh, all the partic participants. Uh, to uh, Akiyama-san, uh, you know, that question uh, dogged us also, and Oliver mentioned it on the European side, that there was a different and continues to be a different assessment of what is strategic and non-strategic that we hear from time to time from the Russians as well. Uh, so it has to do with the uh, geographic proximities on the, <laughs> on the Eurasian landmass, and there's no way you can get around that. But in the fact uh, of the INF Treaty, we, we first broke through on that matter, and the reason we broke through on that matter was because of the short time of flight of intermediate range missiles, and therefore the threat that they posed uh, to critical command and control targets, including command and control of strategic forces, the so-called de decapitation uh, threat. And so I think, you know, these are the types of discussions we need to have with the Chinese to convey to them that it, it's the fact of the, of the short time of flight that should be of concern and interest to them and figuring out ways uh, in their own interest. Of course, they're not going to come to the, the table unless they see a, an interest for their own national security, but placing some constraints and limits on these kinds of systems enhance and preserve in the end of the day their command and control over, over their military forces, including over critical strategic forces. So I, I can see the potential for playing out those same arguments, but you're quite right. That different concept of what constitutes strategic and non-strategic 
uh, has dogged us for many years, including in talks with the USSR uh, several decades ago. But we can overcome it if you if you focus on the concern about uh, about short time of flight and attacks on critical command and control targets. Excellent question, Steve. But I think the interesting thing about uh, the Russian uh, offer, putting the 9M729 on the table, so to say, is that they are taking a neither confirm nor deny approach. They are absolutely not, uh, not committing in any way to saying that this is an INF range missile. So I would not go down the road of seeking uh, to determine that it is uh, because for one thing, that's very difficult to monitor and verify. As you know, the, the range of any missile depends very much on the payload and uh, the, uh, the fuel load. And so those are things that cannot be determined simply by, by looking at them. You can make some measurements, of course, of the fuel tank and so forth and so on. But in the end of the day, those, those types of measurements are not determinant. Instead, I think we have to think about ways to limit and constrain this missile without uh, actually determining that it is an INF violating missile. That's something the Russians, I think, will not agree to, but they have agreed to, uh, to begin to monitor and to verify it and uh, to place some constraints on its deployment, evidently. So those are very interesting developments and I think we need to explore them further, as I said, and also push them further because this is the first offer and it is something uh, that we should be uh, we should be willing to to negotiate about. Uh, for Bill's uh, Bill Courtney's question, uh, also a very good question. That is indeed the approach we took in the New Start Treaty to so-called uh, uh, prompt global strike systems. That is uh, long-range strategic range systems that are conventional in nature, and we had a what we called permit and count approach uh, in a new start and that they were counted essentially as uh, nuclear uh, systems. But there, there are uh, and were and were planned to be very, very few of them. So it was not a big deal to permit and count them in new start. I think for the future, uh, that is why I argue that we should actually look at ways to put the end back in INF and to distinguish through uh, monitoring and verification which systems uh, are limited, conventionally armed systems, uh, perhaps we wanna place uh, some limits on, perhaps we want to ban nuclear armed systems in those intermediate ground launched ranges, perhaps we want to also place limits on them, but rather than uh, permitting and counting them, I think that uh, could get very complicated, especially for the other countries involved, uh, such as uh, uh, China, who uh, really depends quite a bit on its intermediate range ground launch systems and uh, would probably not want to have to uh, permit and count uh, nuclear armed ones in a conventional uh, basket, so to say. Okay, um, the question about uh, the differentiation between uh, a, a tactical and a substrategic and strategic warhead is a question which fits very much in my uh, physics um, experiences. And uh, I'm happy to answer that. I mean, basically, there are only two ways how to determine this. First is a nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon, to paraphrase somewhat Gertrude Stein's uh, notion of a rose is a rose is a rose. So uh, you can only find it out if you see it. This is uh, by the NPT of more or less forbidden. So uh, uh, you can of course uh, determine the size, the yield and um, the uh, other uh, physics characteristics if you make measurements, but this has to be allowed by the uh, uh, inspected party. And this causes a lot of problems. So this is exactly the reason why I said it's a paradigm shift to come from today's nuclear arms control regimes to a future one, which includes the verifiability of nuclear warheads. We have to be very clear on that. The other way is to uh, identify the delivery system. And this is exactly what has been done by INF. It was quite clear that if the INF systems are uh, dismantled, then the nuclear warheads on top of these missiles also can no longer be used or could be uh, used uh, in, in other modes. And uh, uh, for a future treaty, you must be very clear ident identifying, and that can only be negotiated what is tactical and what is strategic. Uh, the range 
uh, a matters of course, and this is an old uh, uh, criterion because the range ICBM is between US and Russia, but uh, for a smaller country with uh, delivery systems with a shorter range, it could a nuclear weapon equipped missile can be also uh, quite be a strategic threat. So uh, we have to put both together, the physical uh, criteria and the uh, characteristics like range, the size of the, the delivery systems. And today's verifications makes it quite easy to uh, find out delivery systems because they are still much bigger than nuclear warheads. But in future agreements, we need a combination and uh, again, um, in Rose's paper, she made the proposal about re-entry or I, I would call it payload on-site inspection. And this was uh, exercised quite successfully uh, within the New START context. And this is exactly one of the reasons to preserve the New START Treaty because inspectors could not open uh, the payload but could, could go close to the re-entry vehicle and to find out how many nuclear warheads are on top of a missile. So uh, if you have that statistics, you can in a sense also uh, recalculate how many nuclear weapons are on which delivery systems. But I think you need the accounting of both systems, from both um, uh, calculations. Thank you very much. Andre, over to you. There was a question on Russian motivation to make these proposals on additional transparency, how far would Moscow be willing to go? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would not say that inspection is impossible. Uh, we've seen that Russia has moved from rejecting the ID in December 2018, saying this is not provided for by the INF Treaty, then offering some kind of demonstration uh, early in 2019. So I would not rule out uh, the possibility for uh, the ins an inspection uh, in exchange for the inspection of MK-41 launchers. Uh, and for this, we would need to have the agreement not only from the US, but also from the host countries, now, not least Romania and eventually Poland. My point would be different. Uh, and this brings me to other questions which have been raised. Uh, it is very regrettable that the INF Treaty is gone but it is gone and uh, this, what we should not do, we should not try to come back into the INF Treaty. It's now uh, about different kinds of weapons. It's not necessarily about nuclear missiles. It is uh, about very different ranges. So we shall not uh, think uh, in, in the parameters of the INF Treaty. This is why my suggestion would be that uh, we uh, look forward to have a complete ban on ground launch to begin with, on ground launch nuclear uh, missiles uh, of sub-strategic range, which would cover both tactical as well as uh, formerly uh, INF range missiles. So to ban all nuclear uh, armed missiles. Uh, and uh, as Rose uh, notes in her article, uh, to verify a, a complete ban is much easier than, than uh, uh, limitations. And we can tackle the issues of conventional missiles uh, in different frameworks. Uh, we do have debates on, on conventional arms control in Europe. And of course, we uh, do discuss, there was a paper by the OEC network uh, published that uh, we uh, shall consider long range uh, precision striking, striking uh, munitions, guide, precision guided munitions in the, in the framework for conventional arms control, some shorter range missiles would be included in the, uh, in the category of artillery systems, etc. So we need to see how we can tackle the issue of conventional uh, ground launch missiles in the conventional arms, by conventional arms control means. And that would not exclude addressing the question of conventional missiles in the, in the uh, North Pacific uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly agree with, uh, with William Courtney that uh, at least for the US Navy, the, uh, the non-nuclear uh, intermediate range missiles by China uh, the headache so far. So my idea would be let's ban the nuclear armed uh, ground launched missiles in all ranges until the strategic range. And then we deal with the rest of the issue by means of conventional arms control. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andre. Um, let's maybe continue along the line of what future framework, what future issues could define the scope um, of next steps uh, in arms control. Um, there is a question on verification from 
uh, Katrin Shimizu over at the Federal Foreign Office on the importance of national technical means versus real on-site inspections, military to military, personal to personal, and how the value of that can be judged. Can we have verification without um, actual on-site inspections? How far can we go? And then um, Gauka uh, Lukacnova in Vienna asks um, if there is in principle a warhead freeze and a one-year extension. The proposal that you mentioned rose in the beginning that's on the table now. And um, Russia also indicated um, that uh, subsequent negotiations should address all issues relevant to strategic stability, which presumably includes long range conventional systems and missile defense. The question is, how will you assess the likelihood of the United States being willing to and able to include these issues in treaty negotiations? Rose, over to you. Thank you. Um, I do want to emphasize, and I noted uh, the question about how far can we go with NTM? Can we dispense with on-site inspection? I absolutely do not do not endorse uh, doing away totally with on-site inspection. I just, uh, as I put it in my paper, see it as a way to reassure, especially new entrants such as China, that uh, you know there won't be an unlimited demand for on-site inspection, that in fact, we can use uh, national technical means to steer and prioritize what kind of on-site inspection we need as we tackle uh, smaller objects uh, at the negotiating table and particularly now looking at this first freeze on warheads and then proceeding in future to have uh, some limits or controls on warheads. These are small objects and very sensitive facilities. They will require, <clears throat> pardon me, they will require some kind of on-site inspection, obviously. <clears throat> And I, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, I'm losing my voice. Uh, I also very much uh, endorse the questioner's notion that there is tremendous confidence building that goes on as inspectors get to know each other. I experienced that again at first hand in the New START negotiations because we had inspectors on both delegations and some of them had worked together over the years on inspections. And of course there were very tough talks on what kinds of new procedures we needed and, and how the inspections were going to go in New START on re-entry vehicle on-site inspection. But, uh, but the fact that the inspectors had worked together and spoke the same language, at least technically, although one group speaking English, the other speaking Russian, it really made a big difference. And so I absolutely endorse uh, the, the questioner's notion that we need to focus on the confidence building aspects of on-site inspection as well. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Oliver, I was uh, so eloquent right now, I forgot uh, the second question. Could you just repeat it very quickly for me, please? The second question I just deleted from the list of questions, somebody helped me out here. Um, this was Gauka. Gauka was missing. That's right. Gauka's uh, question on the framework, if the proposal for a one-year moratorium is accepted and uh, the Russian proposal basically to include all strategic, uh, all nuclear weapons, uh, what could that uh, look like? Um. Well, um, it is, you know, it's a very interesting proposal to have a one-year moratorium um, and include all nuclear weapons as it's a freeze uh, that would not immediately have uh, monitoring and verification associated with it. it. You know, the freeze will be in the eye of the beholder, how exactly, uh, what, you know, what will be included in it. Uh, there's the question of what uh, to do about the uh, so-called weapons dis awaiting dismantlement that are not considered uh, fit for operational deployment. Uh, you know, both sides have those kinds of uh, stockpiles as well. So how, how exactly you uh, define the the freeze will be an important matter, but I think the most important matter going forward will be figuring out uh, exactly how to move forward on monitoring and verification. And I know, uh, again, the uh, Trump administration has put forward the interesting idea of, of doing a verification experiment. And I'm a big fan of verification experiments. That's something that the IPNDV has been doing uh, and 
I think they've been very uh, well carried out. And in the past, there have been various kinds of verification experiments. So I think we will have to depend on that kind of joint work going forward as we figure out the very difficult uh, task of how to monitor and verify uh, small objects and particularly nuclear warheads, which are the most sensitive objects that, uh, that any country uh, has in its possession, I would say, uh, in terms of their weapons of mass destruction potential. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming slowly to the end of this meeting. There are three questions that are on the political framework and the outlook um, of future talks between the United States and Russia, but also potentially with China. And maybe we can take those three in the last round. Um, and I would like to get um, Andre and Götz um, and then maybe Rose to uh, close the discussion uh, off. Um, the first question um, is from Daryl Kimball, um, who um, sits in Washington, and you all know him, uh, our partner in the Deep Cuts Commission at the Arms Control Association to Rose uh, regarding the goal of further engaging China in the nuclear arms control and disarmament process. What is the best forum? Given the fact that China has rejected trilateral forum and Russia wants the UK and France involved, how might the P5 process be augmented to intensify talks on arms control options? Um, and um, Lukas Kulesa in Warsaw uh, asked also to Rose on the diplomatic rather than technical angle of a moratorium. Should the United States and NATO be ready to engage now in some explanatory dialogue with Russia on Putin's moratorium 2.0 proposal, as he calls it, including some restraint on the 9M729? Or should we insist the offer is expanded or detailed before we engaged? Is this a non-starter regardless? Basically, how realistic is this? Is it to engage on this proposal? And then Betty Su from Berlin asked um, um, on the, again, coming back to the outcome of the US election and the contentious outcome, which will have an effect on strategic stability talks and negotiations on new South extension. And Betty basically asked, how does this high level leadership tumult, as she calls it, uh, is it likely to affect the working level bargaining with Russian counterparts? And if I can chip in with one question um, um, from myself, uh, you have been um, working intensely on this issue at NATO for quite some time. Um, a lot of these issues have to be consulted and agreed on in NATO. That process has suffered over the last four years. Do you have any ideas on how we can best ensure that NATO, the need to have NATO consensus doesn't put a break on progress on these issues. That has been a problem sometimes in the past. I'd just be curious, given your experience and insights and how the NATO machinery works, um, what we can do in the future to make this work more efficiently. Shall we start in reverse order? And uh, Götz, if you have any closing remarks or want to pick up any of the issues, I'd give the floor to you first and then to Andre and then Rose as the final opportunity. Thank you, Oliver. And thank you, Oliver. And thank you for the questions. Let me add one sentence about national technical means. Uh, the problem with that is that different states have different national technical means. Uh, but we have also, for example, the Open Skies Treaty, which increases the possibilities for, uh, for crisis instability or for detecting in a cooperative security framework, um, troop movements and other uh, uh, military assets. So I think it would be very important to preserve this treaty and to, to en enhance uh, that. And uh, let me remind you, that, uh, and Rose wrote that in her article, that the key issue here is non-interference. So uh, the old arms control treaties were very clear that NTMs uh, cannot be attacked. If arms control uh, treaties are eroding uh, and, and, and moving to a dustbin, then the, uh, the danger increases that, for example, space assets early warning systems, satellites, 
in principle one day could be attacked. So it would be very wise to uh, find ways, which includes, by the way, also space arms control. So Russia was interested in it. There were some kind of uh, talks in Vienna, and I think uh, the rest of the world would like to see uh, some, some uh, progress here in that uh, respect. So let me finish with that. The time is over, and I'm happy to give to Andre or to Rose. Andre, over to you. Thank you. Let me address one question, I think, from Arthur which was not responded yet, how uh, a ban on nuclear armed missiles can be verified. Uh, of course, this would require some uh, experimenting and uh, looking at the issue in depth. Uh, of course, national technical means is one way to go. Rose elaborates uh, in the article on uh, the role on-site inspections or the experiences from start, which could be used for verification uh, of other uh, weapons. I would look into the issue of whether or not we may agree on non-certification of missiles for nuclear use and whether or not non-certification could be verifiable. And we did have in the late 1990s a fairly promising and interesting uh, work done by in the, within the so-called lab-to-lab dialogue. And we discussed the means uh, of verifying uh, elimination of nuclear warheads in order to proceed to the irreversible nuclear disarmament. And it was very promising outcomes from this dialogue. Uh, and uh, we may come back to the ideas which had been raised at that time. And this would be very important for the verification of warheads, one of the most difficult issues uh, in, in this field. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andre. Over to you, Rose. Thank you very much uh, to both of my uh, co-presenters, to Gotz and also to Andre uh, for these reminders in our last round. And Andre, I'd only say on the on the lab to lab uh, work, which I agree was very very useful and produced a lot of, of uh, good results. Is it possible to get back to that again? Uh, because it has not been possible to work in that way now for some years, and I do think that that is a very promising uh, direction for developing future uh, cooperation on monitoring and verification of warheads, among other challenging matters, and uh, the matter of uh, verifying a ban is on missiles uh, of nuclear nature is, is one that would be an, also an important way. I say in my article that we have reentry vehicle on-site inspection from start, but that's not going to do the job by itself. There will have to be other, other measures uh, put in place as well. Lots of questions. Uh, I will say to Daryl Kimball's question about how to engage China, I have felt for many years that the P5 process uh, it started slowly, but it is slowly maturing now. I do think that it could take on uh, a broader agenda, including uh, potentially in future uh, becoming an actual negotiating agenda, uh, negotiating venue rather uh, for future uh, arms reduction uh, and control. Uh, it's not that now, and it would take uh, considerable work to develop in that direction, but I, I do think it has proven itself as a place where the P5 do get together and have some very serious talks about nuclear and strategic stability matters. And by the way, they've already worked there on some building blocks of future nuclear arms control. The work that is being done on nuclear definitions there, that's a very basic building block for any arms control treaty. And so you can say that there have been some tiny steps taken, initial steps already in the P5 process uh, in, that, in that direction. Um, the range of questions about NATO and, uh, and uh, consultation and so forth, I do think that NATO has come a long way, uh, certainly since my time as undersecretary, uh, when there was not a whole lot of enthusiasm at NATO or interest in working these issues. And I've been very impressed with the work that has been done, uh, even since I left as deputy secretary general over the last year. There have been consultations by the Trump administration and there have been uh, particular tasks that uh, NATO has been asked to, uh, to take on and, and consider uh, ways to develop uh, certain concepts. I think all of this is very valuable and shows that NATO, I think, has the potential to return to the kinds of roles it played uh, during earlier periods, such as the negotiation of the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty and also the negotiation of the INF Treaty. So I endorse and, and believe that we should be striving uh, for further uh, further deep consultation and, and deep 
uh, I would say, work on these issues at NATO. And certainly the, the capacity seems to be developing there now as it had not been uh, in the past. Um, my view is that, um, you know, this offer, the moratorium 2.0 or however you want to put it, um, is an interesting offer because as I said, the Russians have finally offered up the 9M729 uh, in this kind of uh, neither confirm nor deny way, not admitting in any way that it's a violation of the INF treaty. So I think it's, uh, you know, I it's an offer that I would, uh, I would uh, have some discussions with them about. And yes, I absolutely would come back with a, with a tougher demand on them because as I said in my opening remarks, they they're only talking about some kind of uh, monitoring at, uh, at Kaliningrad, and the, yet they're talking about a moratorium that would extend throughout the European part of Russia. So, you know, for one thing, we need to talk about uh, some kind of monitoring regime that would expand and cover uh, more territory uh, in, uh, in the Russian Federation. So uh, it's a first offer from the Russian side. It's not their last and final offer, but that's something uh, that, uh, that uh, use, uh, could use some exploration, I think. And so that would be my, uh, my view of the matter. Thank you very much, Rose, um, also for highlighting, you know, one way uh, that we could take these discussions forward in the short term. Many ideas in the discussion, I think, on the midterm and long term also. Um, that was very useful. Thank you, all three speakers and Frau Baumann for joining um, the event today, in particular to Rose for getting up so early after what was, I'm sure, a short night. Uh, we see in the background the sun coming up in California. Um, I hope it will be a day that brings more clarity and maybe also um, a situation that is more conducive to arms control and progress on arms control and disarmament than the last four years um, have been. Thank you all for joining uh, uh, the discussion and the event today. Again, you can go to our website soon and um, uh, see the recording of it. If you missed uh, parts of it, you can also find papers there, uh, including papers from um, the commentators, Götz and Andre, and many of the people who asked smart questions today. I apologize that there are quite a few smart questions left unanswered in the Q&A. Uh, we just didn't have enough time. Um, but um, I hope it was useful. Nevertheless, um, I really enjoyed it, learned a lot. So the best to you all, stay safe, follow the Deep Cuts Commission, and I hope to see you soon again. Good luck to you all and stay, stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you all very, very much.